we were unprepared for uh, multiple major building collapses happening at the same time. We were unprepared for conflagrations in the urban areas. We were, the citizenry was not prepared to, to protect themselves like they are now. And um, we're light years ahead of where we were in 1971 in terms of public preparedness, public awareness, the science, the integration of science and response, the establishment of all these specialized resources, the training of all the firefighters. Most fire academies now include uh, urban search and rescue training at the basic level. So those firefighters coming out, they know how to do basic building collapse shoring. They know how to the methodology for some of these heavy rescue uh, methods uh, and, and, and incidents. So, um, and then you have now, um, I can tell you in 87, when we went to the Whittier, when we were uh, responding to building collapses in the Whittier earthquake, we were like deer in the headlights. I can tell you the looking at a, a parking structure at a mall that collapsed. Fortunately, there weren't people inside there because it was so early in the morning, but, we knew we were not ready to be able to handle this if it was full of people trapped. And so you have this deer in the headlights look that sometimes happens when you are ex exposed to something you never even thought about before, right? Or had any preparation for. Although firefighters usually we aren't, we'll figure out some way. So it's not deer in the headlights all stop. It's, it's like suddenly, okay, now let's figure out how we're going to do it. But, now we've got teams of firefighters in your local neighborhoods. They may be a specialized urban search and rescue unit, or they may be firefighters that are on the urban search and rescue task forces that are assigned to your neighborhood fire station on a daily basis that knows now, because they've been to these big disasters all around the world, Oklahoma City, New York Trade Center, the Pentagon, uh, earthquakes in other countries like Japan and, and so forth. And they've seen big, big collapses routinely. Now it's like, okay, this one's going to take about X amount of days. We're going to need this much resources for this. And here's, we know how to start it. And here's what we need to do to get to the end state of getting everybody rescued. We know that now. And we have firefighters that are well practiced in it. And we have fire chiefs that have come through this system. In many cases, the executive staff of Fire departments uh, include urban search and rescue operators that have made their way up through the through the ranks. So it's it's a whole evolution of where we are versus where we were in 1971. I want to bring you back to um, the fact that now we're prepared, but you just recently had a study done about 7.5 earthquake in an urban area in Los, like Los Angeles on a normal day versus a Santa Ana wind condition day. I wonder if you can tell me what we have. So the emphasis in a lot of our earthquake preparations was for structure collapse, you know, because we know a bunch of buildings are going to collapse in the next 7.8 Santa Ana's quake if it gets anywhere near the urban urban centers, right? So uh, urban search and rescue was uh, evolved as a, as a matter of course as a result of that. We've done a lot of preparation there. What caught us by surprise was the experience of seeing big cities with huge conflagrations after an earthquake and knowing that that is a game changer that could really change the game for us here. My first experience was 1995, a year after that we had the Northridge quake here. So, and that was in the Kobe earthquake, which was, was a year to the day after Northridge. So I'll go back to Northridge. When Northridge happened, I was assigned to the Urban Search and Rescue Unit here in Pacoima, which was co-located with Air Ops for LA County Fire. We had already game planned for our earthquake response because we knew that one of the priorities was to get helicopters in the air and check the dams first because a dam failing, if you don't get the people out of the way, you'll lose more people from a dam failure than you probably will from all the building collapses combined in many cases. So if we can get the helicopters right up in the air, check the dams, make sure we don't have a dam failing. So we need to start evacuating, check the freeway overpasses, check the big buildings like hospitals and so forth. So, and, and, and look for fires. So that morning I was off duty from the Northridge. I was, I came in from Agora Hills where I lived at the time. The urban search and rescue unit was already out 
doing rescues at the 14-5 interchange collapse and then later on at the Northridge Fashion Center um, parking structure collapse. My job was to get in as a captain, get on the first copter that would be staffed by a pilot coming in because the copters that were on duty were already flying. But get on another copter and get up in the air and start doing damage surveys. So uh, getting up over the San Fernando Valley, right away we started seeing the columns of smoke from the conflagrations that were starting to develop in the East San Fernando Valley. And so we flew those looking for potential for how bad is this conflagration possibly going to get and are there enough ground resources coming to take care of it. In the case of Northridge, it was isolated enough and it wasn't a region-wide disaster. We had enough fire trucks to respond to the, the uh, trailer parks that were on fire here in, in Silmar and some of the commercial buildings that had caught fire to be able to put those fires out before they started spreading into the neighborhoods and really creating a true conflagration. We got lucky in Northridge that it wasn't, a, it wasn't more devastating to the urban areas. It hit just lightly enough. We had enough resources to still have come in and handle the fires and deal with the collapses. But a year later in Kobe, I was sent to the Kobe earthquake uh, as a four person observation team from LA County Fire with some chief officers. And we got there on day two. And what we saw in Kobe shocked us because there was a modern Western style city, reinforced concrete, high rises, mid rises, and a lot of smaller neighborhoods with wood frame construction. They burned out dozens and dozens of city blocks um, because they the firefighters got overwhelmed by the fires. They ran out of water, the cisterns ran dry, the hydrants were out of service in many cases, high, uh, water mains were ruptured, and the firefighters, instead of having uh, the ability to concentrate on rescuing people, had to devote a lot of their efforts to stop on the fires because fires were burning through neighborhoods where people were trapped in collapsed buildings. And so it was a game changer and that was on a cool moist no wind um morning in kobe when that earthquake happened it wasn't a hot dry five percent humidity 30 or 40 mile an hour santa Ana wind condition and they still lost dozens and dozens of city blocks to fire so we were shocked and we came back to la and talked to our chief officers here and briefed them about hey this yeah, there was a lot of building collapses and about 7,000 or so people were killed in the Kobe quake by official estimates. But um, we saw a lot of fire go through neighborhoods that should not have burned, you know. And we're looking at L.A. County and Southern California thinking this could happen here on a far larger scale. And um, so there was a lot of debate about that. And um, um, a lot of... Um, talk about whether we're better prepared or not. And uh, the fact of the matter is we don't have backup water systems in most of Southern California. We don't have cisterns in the ground in the urban areas like they do in San Francisco. San Francisco learned the lesson in 1906, right? And San, Fr San Francisco has a high pressure water system for firefighting only separate from the water, the domestic water system because they learned the lesson when half the city burned down in 1906. Um, we don't have that in Southern California. It wasn't designed into our, our system here when, when we built these neighborhoods. So um, the, the real crux came when uh, we did the shakeout earthquake scenario, which was to say what would, would happen, 7.8 earthquake, the most likely consequences. And part of that was a fire following earthquake study conducted by Charles Scothorn at Kyoto University, now he's at UC Berkeley, and he does a lot of the modeling for the uh, insurance industry and so forth on urban fire mo uh, risk and so forth. And his modeling for the 7.8 earthquake, when they talked about X amount of water mains are gonna rupture, X amount of pipe, uh, gas pipes are gonna rupture, X amount of uh, uh, water, uh, gas mains are gonna fail at the house, and you're gonna have these fires. He estimated that you're going to get about 1,600 simultaneous fire ignitions that would normally require a full fire department first alarm response to a house fire or a commercial building fire. That's three or four engine companies and a ladder truck and a battalion chief, maybe, maybe more engines and two ladder trucks and two battalion chiefs if it's a commercial building. That's what normally would come, and you're going to have 1,600 or more of those at the same time across the greater metropolitan area of L.A., 
but you aren't going to have enough fire engines and ladder trucks to respond to all those 1600 like we normally would on a day-to-day -day basis. You're going to get one fire truck showing up and it might be 20, 30 minutes later by, by the time it makes it to that fire. Now that fire has grown from just one house to maybe three or four homes, maybe one commercial building to multiple commercial buildings. And so consequently, um, you know, about 1200 of those fires will not be able to be stopped by the first arriving fire engine. And so they're going to need more resources and the fires are going to spread. You're going to get a series of urban conflagrations developing across the greater metropolitan area. Some of those conflagrations burning down tens of blocks each and some of those conflagrations merging to become super conflagrations that make their own fire weather. And, you know, like you've seen the fire tornadoes up in Northern California and that's the kind of stuff you're going to see. And as a consequence, his estimate was 133,000 buildings burned to the ground or the equivalent of 133,000 buildings burned to the ground in the days following a 7.8 earthquake on the southern San Andreas Fault. That shocked a, a lot of the firefighters and a lot of the fire chiefs and frankly scared, scared the fire service a little bit into like recognizing that it's not just the building collapses. We got a big fire falling earthquake problem and that modeling was done uh, using a normal November morning, 10 o'clock in the morning without a Santa Ana wind. That, that was the conditions we asked Charles Scothorn to model this fire falling earthquake study on. When we asked him what would that look like if we had modeled uh, the fire weather we had in the 2003 fire siege where California was burning from LA to San Diego, he basically said, you don't want, you don't want me to do that because it's such a overwhelming amount of fire problem that some people will maybe be tempted to say, oh, what's the use, you know, which obviously we're, we're, we're into worst case scenarios, but also being ready for what's most likely to happen, but also keeping in mind worst case scenarios. The worst case scenario with a big Santa Ana wind happening and all that fire following an earthquake is really uh, terrifying. And, and it's got the fire service attention. We're looking at actively, we're looking at ways to try to get ahead of that power curve right now and, and in the future. So there's a lot of discussion going on about how do we augment firefighting resources? How do we um, start hardening the water systems better? How do you start uh, developing uh, alternate water um, supplies in the case of the domestic water supply going out? How do we use the dams and lakes and the oceans, you know, to be able to pump water into areas. We're uh, training and well, the firefighters are already trained how to do what they call relay pumping. They can take a source and line up fire trucks and pump a source of water, you know, a mile or two inland or to, to a spot where they need it. But that's very manpower intensive and it takes fire trucks to do it. So now you're taking more fire trucks out of service to do relay pumping. We practice it. But in the practicing, our firefighters are seeing that it's a limited capability. We can only line up so many fire trucks to, to move water while the rest of the city is burning around us. When you add wind driven fire to the equation, um, it becomes a, like I said, we purposely haven't ha hadn't had that modeled. So uh, a lot of this is um, we're surmising, but you know, if when you, just like we see in wildland fires. When there's a wind behind it, we know you're gonna have exponential growth and that's when we get the town of paradise burning down. Right. That's when you get the Woolsey fire you know, where you got 2000 structures on fire and, and it's the wind changes the whole equation on fire in wildland and wildland interface. And for sure it's gonna change the game uh, if we have urban conflagrations. If we're fighting, Fire. I mean, you go back to like the uh, Anaheim fire in like in the 80s where it started in a, in a palm tree and burned across several blocks of Anaheim because it was a Santa Ana wind day. Right. It started in the city and burned like like three or four blocks down of the city. And, you know, fortunately, they were able to line up enough fire trucks, including from L.A., to come up and and surround the thing eventually and, and, and limit the growth. But if this has happened in the middle of the big earthquake um, disaster, and you don't have enough fire trucks to do that and enough water, and then you got a, a, a 60, 70 mile an hour wind behind it, you know, or a 30, 40 mile an hour wind, and it's six, eight, 
10% humidity and it's 110 degrees, you know, worst case, we're going to have problems because the firefighter is going to have to decide, do I try to rescue these people in the collapsed building over here? Or do I need to try to put this fire out before the fire gets to them? And this is going to change the uh, rescue equation when we're doing our damage surveys, when the fire trucks are rolling out right after the earthquake. They're supposed to con conduct a <clears throat> pre-established pattern uh, route, make sure they check the hospitals and the vulnerable buildings and know what they've got before they typically engage and commit to something. <clears throat> so the problem is if they are passing a, a building that's on fire and they can see that building fire is going to spread if they don't stop it now, they have a decision to make. In, in, the, in years past, we would have said, drive past it, finish your route, then determine if you need to start rescuing people or fighting fire. Now we're, start, we're telling the firefighters and we're letting them figure it out for themselves too. Like, hey, under these conditions, you got to make a decision. If, I can, if I've got 500 gallons of water on my fire truck and I can knock this down right now and stop it from spreading, that's probably a good use of time and water right now. If there's a hydrant, you can refill it. That's even better. But if the hydrant's dry, you may just have 500 gallons. And then continue on your, your survey, uh, damage survey, then figure out how you're going to go to work. But if it's a standalone building and the building is just going to burn by itself in the middle of the parking lot, let that one go. It's the ones that are going to start spreading on you and become a conflagration. That's the key. And so, uh, and they may, that may even be a priority over rescue. If we have a, in the training, we uh, put them in the hot seat and give them scenarios for LA County Fire. One of the things we do for the shakeout, we, we put all the firefighters through this drill of, they go online, they are given scenarios. And one of them is, you got a building across the street, a school that's collapsed. On the other side of the street is a three-story wood frame apartment complex on fire. You know, what are you going to do? We don't tell them you got to do this or that. But they they come to the conclusion, hey, if I don't put that fire out, I'm exposing people that are trapped in that three-story collapse. And maybe the fire is going to spread to these other buildings where we've got people trapped. And you're not going to have hours or days to rescue them because the fire is going to get them first. So it has changed the equation. We know we can rescue people days later in some cases if they're trapped in a collapse but not if fire gets to them first. So this has become a real focal point of our earthquake response planning. And <laughs> we don't have the answers for it all yet. We don't have thousands of fire trucks we can just put into service, you know? We don't have uh, these redundant water systems ready to go. It'll take years to decades to build out the infrastructure like San Francisco has, sure. I think, with cisterns and all the big intersections and things like that. And you gotta have a political world to do that. Too. And you have to, yeah, I mean, there has to be a, and we've we brought these up, these issues up, and we've been working with the water companies uh, for several years now about these issues. They're concerned about it too, because, you know, they know what the potential is. Um, you get water mains rupturing and, and what that could do to your infrastructure. And economically, it's a huge hit to, have that kind of fire go through an area and look what happened with uh, the COVID pandemic and what has happened to our economy. We already knew that a big earthquake like this could devastate the Southern California economy or the Bay Area economy if it was bad enough. And so this is uh, it's really an all hands, should be an all hands effort. We need the recognition that this is a big potential problem and and we need to some, take some action. We've done a lot, enough studies, I think, now. Now we're looking at what actionable things can we do to get ahead of this power curve. So we're looking at, for Cal OES perspective, we're looking at uh, more fire engines. We're looking at um, water, portable water mains, like big uh, water tender, uh, hose tenders that can lay portable water mains down and super pumpers to be able to pump those things using fireboats in the marina like in, they did in San Francisco to pump water inland through these portable water mains. We've talked about things like tapping into the dams and let the water gravity feed down through the rights of way that currently exists for the flood control channels and be able to have water move into the urban areas. I mean, these are conceptual things that we've talked about, but you know, you know it's gonna take a major effort politically economically and maybe legislatively to do 
some of these things. Or a major disaster. Or a major disaster. And we're, you know, we don't want to be having the after action report saying we should have done these things. Right. So we're really leaning forward on these, these issues right now because let's face it, we know this is a race against time before the next big uh, disastrous or catastrophic earthquake happens in Southern California or Northern California. And, and we don't want to be caught flat footed. We won't be caught flat footed, but we want to have as much lean as we can and get ahead of these problems we know are going to confront us. So this is going to happen basically. It's just a matter of how, <laughs> how soon, how much time do we have to prep for it? Well, I think, you know, like we have control over what we can control. Yeah. The infrastructure is a whole different thing. When you start talking about putting in high pressure water mains and the kind of uh, logistics that would have to happen, just like with the subway systems going in, all those things that impact, you know, trying to do that kind of construction and laying that stuff out. And what do the experts think would be the best approach? You know, I feel some ideas out, but you know, there will need to be some, there have been and there will need to be some more discussions by the true experts and how to put this infrastructure piece in if we really want to get ahead of that power curve. And hopefully it won't happen after the next big earthquake. Hopefully we can get ahead of it. But, um, you know, we know this this race against time, um, we may not have that much time till the next big challenge. So, so I just had that question about, so oh. how do you deal with people when they're in that rescue situation? I'm sure they're <laughs> very, very responsive, but particularly also if, like, you were mentioning also terrorists, you're also mentioning Haiti, and like, yeah. again, when... You can see them, but you can't quite reach them yet. And how do you calm them, or how do you deal with people in that situation? So a lot of the, a lot of times when someone's trapped in a collapsed building, they're disoriented. They uh, may have been there for hours. They may be in pain with injuries. They may be bleeding out. So um, you know we're going to try to assess them and make access to them as quickly as possible to try treating them in the debris pile while they're still trapped, if we need to. Um, that's called rubble pile medicine or urban search and rescue medicine. Um, we, that's why we put doctors and paramedics on these urban search and rescue teams. So we have ER physicians that go out with our urban search and rescue task forces, state nationals. So, and they, they can apply all kinds of methodologies that exceed the paramedic scope of practice, including, uh, frankly, I mean, if you needed to use ketamine and a bone saw to do field amputations, that capability is there. Um, not used very commonly because, but you know, because the infection and other things that can happen. But as a as a last resort, we've that has actually happened. Um, treating people for crush syndrome while they're still trapped, um, there is methodology for doing that. Paramedics have a good scope of practice for handling a lot of that. The, the physicians can direct um, some more uh, advanced treatment while we're still trying to get the person out. Meanwhile, you're talking to the person, right? And this could be in any, any language too. So. Um, you know, we need them to know and we make sh one of the, the pre precepts is to make sure they know we're not leaving them. Someone's going to be there until we can get that person out. And just having that presence and especially if they can see that you're organized and you've got a methodology and you don't have the deer in head like look, you know, that obviously in any situation provides a lot of confidence even if they're in pain and they know they're in dire straits to know that someone's coming and they, they have the right tools and they have the right methodology and you can see they have a plan. It's huge. It tends to reduce the panic and so forth. And frankly, if we can get them some fluids and, and make them more comfortable, it's helping their situation. So this humanitarian um, medical pre-hospital care approach really works well. Um, we, we don't have a lot of people by the time we get to them, a lot of times the adrenaline rush has has passed and now they're in the survival mode. So uh, they just want to get out of that thing. And there's aftershocks happening. So they're frightened of the next aftershock. And a lot of times we've had people like in the Haiti earthquake, we've had several instances where the people were trapped in very uncomfortable positions. And in a couple of cases, we couldn't get to some of the victims before they passed. They were still trapped and we rescued some alive and some didn't get out alive. And so, you know, the firefighters are triaging, triaging just like we do in a mass casualty situation out in the open. We're triaging the structures and the conditions of the people and trying to get to the people we can first. That's part of that five stage program. 
Uh, but now when it's in it, trying to get you out and trying to maybe not impact the person next to you who may be trapped also. And if you're lifting a beam here to get you free, that may be impinging on someone else next door. So there's this tiddlywink kind of approach too that sometimes happens. You have to figure out what the reaction is going to be to what you're doing, you know, so you're not making it worse for someone else. And that is all part of the whole approach, including the the humanitarian just touch, you know, now with a mask on and gloves. One of the other evolutions is in the canine search field. Um, when I first came on the fire department, you know, some fire stations had dogs, but they're like the pet dogs, right? And this, yeah, the the er <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we had, you know, there was dogs that used to ride on the fire truck, you know, and all those things. <laughs> but uh, when we started ge this development of this thing called urban search and rescue, one of the aspects of it was uh, search capability for canines. And, you know, we had a conversation with some of our chiefs where we proposed training these dogs, letting the firefighters bring the dogs to work to train with them. And one of the chiefs, who was a great guy, but his, you know, this is to show you how kind of cutting edge as these ideas were, and how uh, foreign that they were to the norms at the time. His comment was, the, over my dead body, will we have dog kennels and fire stations? Well, you know, 25, 30 years later, you can go around LA County Fire Department right now, you could find 15 fire stations that have kennels, full kennels, that firefighter that runs that dog, he brings the dog to work, just like the canines for law. And that dog is with them at the fire station all day. He trains the dog, you know, in after hours at the fire station. And those dogs are also not just waiting for a disaster to happen somewhere where we take them on part of the task force, going to some disaster somewhere. But if a vehicle drives off one of these cliffs up here in the San Gabriel Mountains and we are missing a victim, uh, we think, especially at nighttime, maybe a, the, uh, a driver or passenger got ejected, we can respond, one of these dogs right now in a fire truck to your scene, lights and sirens and get a dog there right now doing a grid a pattern search that will help clear the, the scene and locate people faster than we ever would have been able to in the past. So these dogs now are, are really first responders in many cases where we need them. Uh, if you have a building collapse by itself, we can get those dogs in there right now within 20, 30 minutes, they can be operating. So um, you don't have to wait for uh, an urban search rescue team to, to come hours later. So this is how we're building this capability into our daily operations here in LA County Fire.